the the mixed spice nutmeg and those cloves and then we've also got that indulgent chocolate ganache layer which we're going to spike and make all really really gingerbready and it's got this really deep gingerbread pie uh, pastry case as well pie crust so we'll be showing you how to make all of those Pros, I mean, I've said this is intermediate, but actually the pastry is so easy to make. It's just gonna be made in one bowl. We're gonna get our hands dirty. We're not gonna be using any electrical appliances. So yeah, this is really easy. And that filling, once we've baked our pie case, is absolutely no bake. So you can get it and put it in the fridge. Once you've done it, put it in the fridge and you can make head ready for whenever you're doing it. Morning, Rachel, good morning. Cons wise, we're going to be minding out those soggy bottoms and we're going to be talking about how we make sure that we don't get a soggy bottom as well. So we're going to be getting into that as well. So I'm going to talk to you about all these ingredients and things that we've got going on at the side. Now, I've said this is easy, although it's intermediate because we need a little bit of patience and it does look, I've done it again, wrong side. <laughs> it does look like you've got an absolute plethora of ingredients that you need here and equipment, but actually half of those ingredients are our spice mix because we're going to be using, we're going to be mixing together our own spices to get that warm gingerbread sort of taste through. But there's a couple of things. So mainly we're just be making a standard short crust pastry with butter and sugar and our flour, but we're going to be doing it slightly different. We're going to be using a melted uh, butter mixture rather than rubbing in our butter into our flour. So, you know, I've got a little bit of a throat this morning, so apologies. You hear me drinking. <laughs> Let's get in and run down our ingredients then. So I've written them down today. <laughs> Otherwise I squint at the screen. <laughs> We're going to be starting off with our butter. Now, as last week, I've put 175 grams on there. That is for two things. 120 of that is for our pastry. And the other 55 is for our, pie, uh, for our filling, for our tart filling. So I've separated those out. But this is unsalted butter. You can use slightly salted if you want. Add a, if you're using unsalted, you might want to add a a tiny pinch of fine sea salt in there just to bring out that flavor. But like most pastries, when they say it needs to come from the fridge, you need it to be cold, you'll notice the butter is at room temperature and actually it's been out all morning. That's because we're gonna melt it, so I don't have to worry about it being cold because we're not gonna be rubbing in. So this is fine at room temperature. That's 120 grams there for our pastry and 55 for our filling. Now, sugar. I want to talk to you about sugar. We're going to be using a dark brown sugar and that's going to give us that richness and that gingerbready taste and texture and depth within our pastry. Now, you can use a regular soft dark brown sugar, perfectly fine. You could use a dark muscovado sugar, really get that depth of flavor in. But what I'm using is this, which is even deeper. And this is from Billington's. Um, they very kindly have sent me this. This is molasses. So it is um, like a really more deeper, darker, unrefined dark sugar. So you might not be able to see too much the color difference. But this is my regular soft brown dark sugar. And that's my molasses. So this is a lot deeper and darker. And it's not a liquid molasses, this is the, the sugar. And you can get this in the supermarkets, various places. This is Billington's definitely do this. But if you can't get this, you don't wanna use it, you just wanna use regular dark brown sugar, go for that. I'm not using a light brown sugar because I want to get that real depth of flavor and that decadence and indulgence which goes with our filling as well. So we're using 120 grams there. Just move these out of the way. And then to bind this all together, 
you can use honey or you can use golden syrup. I always use golden syrup in my gingerbread. I like the sweetness that it gives. Gingerbread always feels that warming, I keep saying warming a lot today, <laughs> but that warming sort of big comfort hug that you get. And I find that it's the ginger, it's the golden syrup that really sort of adds that real sweetness to it. So we're going with golden syrup, but if you don't want to use golden syrup, you can substitute for runny honey. And that's going to be melted in with the butter and the sugar. Flour-wise, we're using 400 grams of plain flour. This has been sifted, but this is just regular plain flour or all-purpose flour. No raising agents today, no bicarb, no uh, baking soda or anything like that, or baking powder, just regular, plain, all-purpose flour, 400 grams. And then I said, we're going to be making our own spice mix. We're just going to be throwing it all in. And if you've got odds and sods in the cupboard of, of mixes and things that you don't always use, this is the perfect <laughs> time for doing it. So first up, we're going to be using ground ginger. I don't know if I've got quite enough in this one, so I've got another one out. And this is just regular ground ginger. And this is going to give us that heat in our uh, pastry and that ginger, that gingerness. So we're going to be using quite a bit of that, three tablespoons. Then we've got some mixed spice. Excuse me. And we're just going to be adding a little bit of that in. And sort of mixed spice tend to use in like my, my homemade mince meat and things like that, Christmas, my Christmas cake, to be using that. But we are then also going to add in a little bit of extras, um, a little bit of cinnamon, just ground cinnamon. Um, I'm going to add a pinch of nutmeg. That's not on there, but I put nutmeg in the pastry that I made last night. It tastes amazing. So I'm putting a quarter of a teaspoon of nutmeg in and some ground cloves. Now, cloves is one of those things not everybody likes it. You can skip this bit out if you want because there will be a little bit of clove in the mixed spice. But we're going to be adding a quarter of a teaspoon of mixed cloves. So these are your spices then. We've got uh, the ground ginger, the mixed spice, the cinnamon, the ground nutmeg, and the ground cloves. And all this together, we'll mix it in with our flour and we'll get a really sort of spicy, lovely, warmy, sweet from the cinnamon uh, pastry with those. So them over there so it's your pastry so let's say we're, we're about three quarters of that way down the list <laughs> it's, you know we've, we've we've got through a fair bit of ingredients and that's just on our pastry for our filling then we're going to be making with dark and milk chocolate i've got some cadbury's bourneville but then i've also got some they say you can use uh supermarket substitutes if you're doing things on a budget this is aldi's milk chocolate um which is just perfectly fine for making a filling as well. So we're going to be blending the two together on our filling. And that's because I don't want the dark chocolate to really overpower the spices that we're going to be adding into it and giving that gingerbread warmth. So having that balance between the milk and the dark will just give us that really lovely, nice, um, decadent filling, but also let the, the gingerbread flavor come through as well my words aren't coming out very well today apologies you're also going to need for our filling some double cream which is in the fridge and we'll need 300 mils of that so that's about a pot if you're buying um just in the supermarket it's just easier you know but some of those pots say that the 298 mils but or 297 or something like that but that extra missing two it's perfectly fine <laughs> just put the pot in and don't worry about opening another one and then finally, this is optional. I've had this sat in my cupboard for pre-COVID. Um, <laughs> it hasn't been opened. But this is um, a gingerbread liqueur. Now, you can get lots of different gingerbread liqueurs. Um, uh, there's some amazing ones out there. But this is um, the Aldi Valley Castle. And it's like a gingerbread Baileys, really. And I'm just going to add this into my um, into my filling, give it that little bit of an adult kick to it with a little bit of booze, but then just emphasize that gingerbreadiness. 
So this is going to go through. You can also use sort of like the monin, the gingerbread syrups and things like that, but you'd only just need a little bit of a tablespoon. We're going to be putting quite a bit of this in. But this is entirely optional because we're going to be adding those spices to bring everything through. So that's our equipment. And then on, sorry, that's our ingredients. Uh, then onto our equipment then. This is all you're going to need, really, apart from something to bake your tart in. You're going to need your hands and you're going to need a big bowl. This is really what we're all going to be using today. But you'll also need um, some baking beans or some rice or some dried pasta for blind baking our cases. I've got baking beans somewhere and every time I try and look for them, I can't find them. So I've ended up with a bag of uh, dried rice and dried pasta that I use for baking. So there are those. The uh, usual accoutrements, palette knives, sharp knives, fork spoons, etc. And then I've gone this the wrong way because I wanted just to talk to you a little bit about the baking cases. A little gingerbread man cutter if you want to add some. Oops, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Add some decorations to the top. But then those top ones, individual tart rings. Um, I'm going to be using these today or an eight inch loose base tart tin. Now, this is a standard one that you'll see most people making a tart in. You can get these quite easily off the Internet or in your baking stores. You want a loose bottom one because it will help you get your tart out the tin. This is eight inch. It's about an inch or so deep. But this means we're going to get a nice um, pastry case and a nice depth for our tart. What you don't want to do is get a really low tart tin and then you've only got a little bit of an edge to your pie crust your tart crust, and then you can't get enough filling in. So make sure it's at least um, two centimetres, an inch in depth there in order for you to get a really good tart and your filling in. But what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be using these. You, they're becoming more and more popular. You see people doing them on Instagram and, and all sorts of places, all on those social medias. They, they're just a ring. And I know that's not very helpful showing you there, but it's just a, um, a ring. And then it's got lots of little perforations in lots of little holes. It's a perforated tart ring, I think they're called. And this will allow the pastry to bake really crisp. We're going to be making a separate base, sort of literally using that to cut the base out. And then we'll cut strips out for the side and create them like that. And I've got some already in the fridge to show you later. But... You can do it either way, an eight inch loose base tart tin or about five or six of these as well. But yeah, so that's our ingredients and our um, equipment. I felt really organized this morning and um, I felt really good and I still do. But it seemed <laughs> the more I feel good about this, the more I think I'm missing something. <laughs> So if we get part way through and I realize I've forgotten to tell you something, then uh, you'll know why I'm feeling good. And, and then, uh, you know, it all goes a bit to pot. Anyway, <laughs> let's get on. Let's get stuck in. I'm just going to move some bits and pieces around. And yeah. so then our pastry now i've said i said this uh, when we started this pastry isn't a traditional cold butter flour rub in we're actually going to be making a warm buttery mixture and then adding our flour into that and again it just brings together that whole gingerbread texture flavor depth there we're not making a gingerbread dough, we're making a, a pastry. So it's slightly sort of less um, soft and squishy. It's more short and crisp. So we're going to, in a small saucepan then, add our butter. So 120 grams 
of um, unsalted butter. Again, room temperature doesn't need to be uh, anything else. And then 120 grams, again, of our sugar. This is that um, molasses sugar, the dark, the really dark one, or your soft brown sugar. Get that in there. And then we're going to go in with golden syrup. Now, if you are in the States, you could use a corn syrup instead. And all, like I say, runny honey. This stuff is pure golden delight. I absolutely, I mean, I could just probably eat it, which wouldn't do my teeth very good. But we're going to be using three tablespoons. Now, this is one of them ones you can um, get it some hot water, dip your spoon in it, and then scoop it up and out. But I'm just going to sort of eyeball this a little bit. I'm going to... Oh. It's so satisfying, that golden syrup drop. So that's one, two. And they are slightly more than a tablespoon, so I'm only going to do half of that. Scrape off the edge. If anyone that uses it, it's so sticky. So we're just going to get rid of that pretty much straight away into the water. And then this now, you can do this as usual in the microwave, but I'm going to do it on the heat because I don't want to scorch anything. So I'm going to pop this on the heat for the butter, the sugar, and the golden syrup all to melt together on sort of a medium low heat and we'll get everything else ready. So that's there. And I'm just going to pop that there. Now a bit like when we're melting chocolate, take that till it's almost melted, till the butter will be the last thing there to melt. So take it till almost all the butter is melted, remove it from the heat and just give it a stir. The residual heat from the, the melted sugar and the golden syrup will melt the remainder of the butter. It also helps to start that cooling down process because what we don't want to do, because we're going to be getting our hands in there as well, is take that straight from the heat and put it into our bowl with our flour because, you know, we don't want burns or anything so it really does feel discombobulating when I've been so organized and I'm just like what am I missing anyway it'll be fine here we go we're gonna get our flour and our spice mixed together whilst that is melting together so this is 400 grams of plain or all-purpose flour no raising agents, nothing in there, straight in. I'll use that bowl again shortly. And then we're going to go in with our spices. Ah, now, see, I've seen two things on the side that I didn't tell you about. It's just for decoration. But you can cut uh, gingerbread men out with the from the dough. But you can also, if you want, just buy little gingerbread men and pop on the top. And I've got some of my festive sprinkles from Sprinkly again as well. Some red and white ones. I knew there was something I forgot. And listen out for that. So we've put our plain flour in the bowl, and then we're going to go in with our spices. So we'll start off with the ginger. So that was three tablespoons of ginger, and this is half a teaspoon, so it's six of those. In fact, I thought I might have finished the thing, and I have, so I'm just going to... So I wasn't sure how much ginger I had left, and I bought some more the other day, and he said, why do you want more ginger? I was like, 
because we're nearly out and we are so that's three tablespoons of ginger or thereabouts depending on how much was left in the jar but it's about three tablespoons um and then we're going to go in with our other um ingredients so some cinnamon ground cinnamon two remember this is half a uh, half a teaspoon measure because it's the only one I, can. I can't get the the full teaspoon into the jar i can hear that bubbling away so we'll check on that in a moment actually let's check on it now because it's butter and sugar and we don't want it to I did have a moment yesterday when it i splashed all over the hob with <laughs> Butter. So I made this last night as well because we are going to chill this. So I'm just giving it a stir there. And it's almost there. There we go. The smell just from that molasses and the golden syrup and everything together is amazing. So this is our ground cinnamon and our ground ginger. We're now going to go in with a teaspoon of mixed spice. You can get the lid off. Nope, not quite that much. I don't have a preference with spices as well. I get, I buy whatever is in the supermarket. I mean, I've got some Aldi, I've got some Barts, I've got Swartz, everything here, Tesco's. So, so like when you pick things up for recipes over the years and they just sit in the back of the cupboard, this is a great way of getting rid or using them up. So a teaspoon of mixed spice and then a quarter of a teaspoon, this one doesn't want to go in, of nutmeg so that's half of that remember this is half a teaspoon and cloves now let's say cloves is not everybody's cup of tea i use it in pumpkin spice mix um and my homemade mince meat and my christmas cakes and stuff like that so that's our spices we are going to be using them again in our filling i haven't put measurements for the filling because it depends on your taste really for that this is bubbling away nicely so i'm going to bring this over here so oh god it smells amazing this is our butter our sugar and our golden syrup in here and it's it's just a, a, a so this is too hot to put in here at the moment if i put it in it's just going to scorch everything and i want to be getting my hands in and making my pastry so I'm just going to leave this for a moment just to cool down until I can handle it. Because remember, it's sugar. It's, it's hot sugar in there. And then in here, we're just going to mix together our spices and our flour. And I'm mixing it so we've almost got a spice flour base to start with. And then I'm not having to try and get things in and make sure I've got all my spices well dispersed. Remember when you're doing anything with lots of flour as well, is like to scrape the bottom of the bowl, you'll find that you end up with pockets of flour and things down there. So, I've really worn the wrong dress for making pastry, but hey. So there we go. Whilst that is sat there just having a bit of a chill and our flour is mixed together, let's sort of talk a little bit about, um, well, let's get the pastry cases out and I can show you what we'll be making.
I'm also going to tell you about my pastry disaster. I tempted fate. I put on the Facebook this week um, on the page. I asked if anybody had had any baking disasters. I had a pastry disaster last night. <laughs> my pastry was too dry, too crumbly. I've, I've saved it um, and I've rectified it. So I'll tell you how we do that when we get the pastry out and roll it. Um, and I'll show you how crumbly it was. But oh my God. 10 o'clock last night, I was trying to rescue this pastry. And then this morning, I had an entire epiphany of how to do it. And I will explain that to you. But these are our little tart cases. These are the tart rings that we saw. These are, I think, about four inches, 10 centimeters um, in diameter. So they do make quite a reasonable size tart. They, again, they've got a nice depth on them. So we'll get lots of filling in there. You could serve this as one per person or you could split them in half. So, um, yeah, that's those. But you can also use the, the larger tart case. So this is what we'd be doing. I'm taking these out the oven, out of the fridge now because I want them to sort of come to room temperature a little bit before we bake. Right. It's cooled down slightly. It doesn't need to be totally cool, uh, but it needs to be cooled down slightly. I can touch the side of the pan. That's fine. So what I'm going to do is not knock that over because I'm going to make a well in the center of my pastry, uh, of, my, of my flour mix, and I'm just going to pour this into the middle of that. Get everything out. All that lovely sugary goodness. Let's pop that in the sink. To the sink. So, and now I'm just going to start bringing it in from the edge into in the middle. It's too wet at the moment to put my hands in, so I'm just going to keep folding together. Now, I'm going to start helping this bind together with a little bit of cold water, which is chilling out in the fridge at the moment. But you can uh, use something like an orange, uh, or not necessarily orange juice, but squeezed orange. Um, if you want to add a little bit of a complementary flavor to the gingerbread, you could zest some orange in here as well. But we're not, we're just going to go through. So as I folded that in with the spatula, you'll see that it's still quite floury and um, sort of crumbly. So we're going to get our hands dirty now. Take a watch off. And I'm going to get this water out of the fridge. I'm going to start off pulling it into with my hands and squishing it together. This is going to get... I'm going to get absolutely covered. And then as I feel that texture, I can add the water to it. So clean hands, roll your sleeves up or push your sleeves back and in. And just bring it together with your hands. Now, if you don't like getting your hands dirty with pastry, people don't, I, I don't like it when it sort of, your fingernails, unfortunately, it's part of the, the process. You can do this in um, uh, a stand with a stand mixer or with your hand mixer. That's why they are on the ingredients list. If you're doing it with a stand mixer, you want the paddle attachment as if you were making a cookie dough um, and just regular beaters on a hand mixture. Or you can get um, pastry cutters, not 
not the round ones. <laughs> um, uh, if you've seen them, it looks like a like a stirrup, a horseshoe stirrup that's got um, that's split, so it looks like it's um, feathered. The handle on top, and you use that to bring your pastry together. Now, this is coming together, but I can feel it's not holding together very well. So I am going to add a little bit of cold water. It's quite crumbly. And this is where I went wrong last night. I didn't add enough. I just, at this point, just squished it all together and it went slightly horribly wrong. So I'm just going to add, add it in tablespoons. And I'm using cold water. It doesn't have to be from the fridge, but if you've got chilled cold water, it will just help. And before I turn this out onto the work surface, I just want to make sure I'm, it is coming together properly as a dough. And it is. So we're going to turn this out now. Um, so I'm just going to add some a pinch of flour just to my work surface. Stop it sticking. And this is where I make an absolute mess again. And I'm just kneading it together and picking up those bits. And you'll notice that if you, when you're doing this and the dough's coming together, if it's coming together and it's picking those sort of bits up quite easily and it's not falling apart, you've probably got the right consistency of dough. If you're kneading it and it's crumbling and it's sort of just breaking up, then you probably need to give it a little bit more water. Don't forget, you've just added flour onto your work surface, so that will start to dry out a little bit as well. I'm just gonna add a sprinkling on my fingers of the water. not soggy it's sort of and it's not sticky it's but we don't want to overwork it and I am using probably a bit more force than I should be going to shape that into a pat and grab some cling film and wrap it up. The dough does need to rest. You've got melted butter in there. We've got sort of the golden syrup as well, all those liquid things. If you try and roll this now, it will just sort of either be massively sticky or fall apart. So you need to give it time to chill and everything sort of come back together before you do anything with it. It's just... I am not a fan of making dough by hand, but I wanted to show you how well it's done. This now goes in the fridge for at least 30 minutes. You can split this into portions if you don't want to use all of it and put some in the freezer. What I'm going to do with this is this will be chilled in the fridge and then I'm going to pop it in the freezer 
because uh, I don't need to use all of it today because I've already got some made. So which we're going to get out. I'm just going to give a little bit of a wipe down. Let's just get rid of that. I mean, we are going to roll out again. I'm going to show you a different way of doing it. Okay. So we've got our dough now chilling in the fridge. Really easy. And actually, if you do it with the mixer, it just is even quicker. And you don't have to worry about getting dough from underneath your fingernails. <laughs> but what we're going to do next is we're going to roll some dough out. We're going to line our tart tins, um, rings, cases, whatever we're going to be doing. And we're going to be getting those in the oven this morning. So... You'll have just seen that I took some dough out of the fridge. This is the dough that I rescued this morning. This is a piece of unrescued dough that I want to show you. And these are our cases ready to go. So they are just chilling out on the back. And this is a, so massive bake fail with this. The mix of dough that I made last night, I didn't put enough liquid in it. And you can rescue it. If when you go to roll it out, it starts crumbling, just like I just did there with the cold water and put some on my fingers and sprinkled it over the top, you can do the same and bring it back together. Try not to over knead it when you're doing that because it will just sort of then work the gluten out too much. But you can sprinkle water over the top and it will help do it um, and things. But this, I saved a bit. If you ever had fudge that's gone hard and crumbly, um, it's like that. I'm doing it over here, but you probably can't see it very well. But it's just a real crumbly texture that... Um, when you try and knead it together or you try and like rub it like that, it just falls. It's quite, it's not powdery as such, but it's not great. And then when you, when you sort of go to work your pastry and look at it, you'll see it's quite, you can see it's dry inside. And when you, you break a bit off, you get this rough um, surface to it, but it does, like if, if the dough's nice and perfect, it will be quite uh, malleable, but this just crumbles into crumbly texture. So that's that. It's not it's not good pastry. <laughs> I had a total bake fail. But I came downstairs because last night when I was rescuing that to make those tart tins, I was putting water and I was kneading it, I was adding flour and then I was adding more flour, and then it was getting dry because I was adding flour, and then I was adding water, and I was backwards and forwards, and about half an hour later, I got the cases done, but I was just exhausted by it. Then I woke up this morning, I thought, do you know what? I'm going to, because I was going to do, I was going to show you bringing it back to life on camera, but no one wants to see that because it was hot and bothered and it really wasn't good so I came down this morning I thought you know what we can do this an easy way I got the pastry out and let it come up to room temperature for a few moments and then I took that crumbly pastry put it in the stand mix bowl of the KitchenAid crumbled it up and you look at it and you think how on earth is that all going to come together into a pastry well I crumbled it up and I started with two tablespoons of water and I did that and then started mixing it together and the action from the mixer with the paddle attachment started bringing everything all nicely back into a nice dough form. Kept doing it, it didn't overwork it because I don't want to overwork that gluten of the paste in the pastry. But I ended up with a really malleable dough that I can feel and it's not crumbly or anything. It's a really good gingerbread pastry. And that's what we're going to start with today. So 
when we are rolling pastry. Now, you can do this straight on your work surface if you want to, and you can pick it up and you can move it all around and you can add more flour. Then your pastry dries out, so you add a bit of water and you get in this repeat process that I got in last night because something I totally forgot that I always do. And just last night, because I was having the, the strop with the, the pastry not being right, I totally forgot. I'm going to use my baking parchment. Now, I went on a patisserie course, oh, many years ago now, probably about nearly about eight, nine years ago. I treated myself after I closed the shop and I went to Le Manoir and did a pastry course at uh, Raymond Blanc's cookery school. And they taught this trick. And I love it. Now, you can do this with baking parchment or you can do it with clean film. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be rolling our pastry between two sheets of baking parchment. And this means that we don't have to add any extra flour or any extra water because it will dry out. It will help keep everything together and it will give us a really nice smooth pastry. It also means that when, if you're doing it in a, in a big tart tin, that you can just pick your pastry up, obviously um, remove one of the things, but you can pick your pastry up and use this as a guide for getting everything in the tin. So whilst it looks like it might be a bit faffy, it's actually super cool for getting everything together. And I, again, totally forgot this last night when I was having a straw and a gingerbread pastry. So we're going to be doing that. You're going to need a rolling pin. This is just a, my big cake rolling pin, but you can just use a regular wooden rolling pin. But you want to make sure that your rolling pins, I've seen lots of people using the tiny sugar modeling rolling pins. Just use a standard normal rolling pin. The reason being is that you can spread the, the pressure um, a, over a wider surface area, which gives you... It's less handling of the pastry, less m sort of moving it around, gives you an even thickness as well. And those little ones, if you're using them all, you're just doing edges and you don't get a really nice even pastry. So the bigger the rolling pin, the better, but just a regular wooden rolling pin. In fact, one like this is perfect. One like this is no good. <laughs> so a decent size rolling pin. Let your pastry just have a few minutes, just getting accustomed back to room temperature. Uh, otherwise, if you try and roll cold pastry, it, it just, again, it's frustrating. It's, it's nothing but frustrating. <laughs> But I'm going to, I probably won't need all of this, but I'm going to roll that out. So I've put my pastry in the middle of my big piece of baking paper. And put my other one on top. And you can press it down just to start if you like. Let's move that out of the way. And then with my rolling pin... can just roll out also is easier so if, if we see when you're doing pastry or you see people do pastry and they pick it up i mean i do with kate you pick the fondant up onto the rolling pin you pick the pastry up onto the rolling pin and you move it around a quarter turn i find with pastry if you've done it on the work surface and you've got flour it can be a bit sort of again I don't want to use the word crumbly, but it's not as, um, it doesn't hold its shape as well. So this means that, you know, I, quite easily I can just do a couple of rolls. And turn. As you can see, when I was talking about your pressure on your rolling pin, my hands are towards the end. They're not in the middle. If I roll and my hands are in the middle, you see people rolling like that. All I'm doing is putting the pressure 
into that central part of the pastry and I'm, it's not going to spread out. So by putting my um, hands here, I'm getting a good even pressure across the width of my pastry as I roll it. And giving it that quarter turn all the time just helps it get an even thickness across. Now, if you find that when you're doing this, one side pops out the side of your baking parchment, no bother. You can cut it off. This might actually do it, so we'll see. You can cut it off and pop it back in and roll it together. And it's less of us handling the pastry as well. So sorry if you can hear my heavy pastry breathing. <laughs> Now, I can see it's popping out the side there. It's not quite enough for me to cut it off, so I'm not going to. But you want to roll it till it's about a pound coin thickness. So that's three, three, four mil. You don't want it too thin. If it's too thin when you put it in your case, or use the tart ring, you can risk it tearing and getting a hole in it, So, you, which is what obviously you don't want. I've just got a couple of edges there that I'm just going to pull. So where I can see it's coming out the side, I'm just going to sharp knife. See, this is still a bit too thick at the moment, but I'm just going to go and stick it a bit like a patchwork up there. And the same with that one. And as we roll, those will come together. So let's just do that first. And as you work the dough and you roll it out, you'll find that it's obviously it's warming up so it becomes easier to roll. Let's just do our sides. Nearly there. Gonna have a look and see how those joins are. Nearly there, actually. The top, the first one we did is nice. The second one just needs a little bit of an extra join. <laughs> With this as well, because you've got it between the baking parchment, don't be afraid to peel it back and have a look. It's, uh, you can see it obviously as you're working with it, but. Don't be afraid to peel back. Oh, have a look. I'm so pleased I reworked that dough in the uh, in the KitchenAid this morning. There we go. So I'm going to do this in my big pan because I've got a couple of the little ones there. So I'm going to do it in here um, first. I was going to do it in the tart rings. We'll see how much um, how much pastry we have left over. So the other beauty with doing this with your parchment is, like I say, you can lift, but you can also see put your tin on the top. And go, yep, that's that's big enough. <laughs> Remember that when you're doing it, you want to make sure you've got enough room around the sides for you to lift in and put your pastry in and all the way around so we're not sort of cutting um, ourselves short anywhere. 
I am just going to roll that to the final edges. Now you can uh, use a non-stick pan if you want, or you can give it a little bit of a grease. Um, you don't need too much. I'm in the fridge. I wouldn't use a release or a cake spray or butter, butter it. This. If you're using block butter, proper butter, it's a trick my granny taught me. Always save your butter papers. Just fold them up and keep them in the fridge. I've got a stash of them. Because when you open them out, they still have butter on it. And for something like this, or just a quick grease, it's the perfect amount of butter. You don't need to do anything else. So you can just use your butter paper. Because you don't want to be adding too much on here. If you add too much on it, then it will like give you a really crispy edge or that butter will hook it out a bit first. But just give it a, a run round. And then that's it. Done. Keep your butter papers. It's just, it's an utter game changer. I mean, I love my cake release and stuff like that. I make my own. But for just a quick grease where you don't want too much, it's absolutely perfect. Especially if you're greasing a pan to then line with baking parchment, you see people grease the pan, line it. You, again, you don't want a huge amount because it just makes it all soggy. Use the butter pack paper and then do it that way. So we will be going into two minutes silence at 11 o'clock. I'm just thinking, what do we want to do? I'm going to put them in the oven, but let's get this going first. Actually, we'll do it this way around. I'm going to bake the ring cases that I prepped last night whilst we're on the live, because I'm going to then put this together and then chill it again in the fridge just to let the pastry settle. So we're going to bake at 180 degrees for about... 15 to 20 minutes for those and a little bit longer for the tart case, but and I will prep this. I'm just was having a back. So Preheat the oven 180 degrees because we're going to pop some in the oven. But we've greased our loose base tart tin and we've rolled our pastry out. Now, our pastry is, like I say, about three millimeters um, depth, which is about the depth of a pound coin. I've got this beautifully now with some paper parchment paper. I'm going to save that because it will get used again. And it means, look, you can handle your pastry so much easier this way. Still support it. But you can then just flick it over. Now, don't be tempted to push straight down. Lift it into the tin. If you push straight down, you're just going to rip your pastry. But you use that baking parchment still to help you lift, lift, lift. 
lift and lift. Now I can see before I even get there that I've got a lot of overhang. So I'm just going to cut that off first because that overhang will start pulling everything down um, on the edges of your tart tin. So get rid of that big excess first and it will help you. And then just lift and again like I say just use the the baking parchment to guide it. Okay, we're about to go into a two minute silence, so I'll keep doing this, but I'll be quiet. Um, it is Remembrance Sunday to remember those who gave their todays for our tomorrows. Thank you. Um, people, I don't know you guys, if you've family members in forces serving past, um, and not just people, but animals that gave their lives as well, and, and everybody else um, for what we have. Um, I find it quite moving, so I try not to cry. Anyway. The tart hasn't fared. It's enjoyed its two-minute silence. I've just been pushing the edges in using the paper to help me. Um, I'm not pushing into those gaps. The pastry will find its way into those gaps as it bakes. But what you can do is, with the edge and just your finger now, is just run that round that sort of... The, the the join at the bottom just to make sure you're in there and it's I just find this such an easier way using the parchment for lining my cases like this uh, yeah so and I'm just going to now start pushing down on the edge now I'm not going to push right down on the edge because if I do that where it ends up it will then cause shrinkage and we don't want it to shrink when it bakes 
So I'm just going to give it a little bit of a handy start. Oh, look at that. I'm not going to pick it up. If I pick it up, it's all going to go wrong. But I'm just going to take my sharp knife, a sharp, unserrated knife, um, and just work away just to cut some of that excess off first. Oops. Now, you could do this with a no-bake tart case. Um, you could do it with the ginger nuts, um, my toffee apple um, tart on the website is made with a ginger nut no bake case. Um, it's perfect, but with that has a baked filling, so it does get baked, but you can use the same for this. So now I'm just going to, with my sharp knife, go around and trim the edge. I'm not going at a flat angle, I'm going at slight angle, so it has a little bit of a raise, and that so it gives it a little bit of chance for shrinkage. But we're going to chill this anyway. Now I've got plenty of dough left over. So you can do this actually with a, a smaller uh, half portion dough. I forgot how much this. I'm just like I say, I'm organized today, but I feel a bit lopsided. Um, this is going to go in the fridge chill. If I bake this now, I've been working with it. The butter's all warm again. If I put it straight in the oven whilst the pastry is warm, I'm going to get a soggy bottom because it's uh, the pastry isn't nice and cold. That butter's not nice and cold, and it's not going to crisp up. It will just sort of get soggy and wet as that butter just goes through more melting. So by putting it into the oven, sorry, the fridge for half an hour, or you can even put it in the freezer if you want, um, it will uh, help give you a nice crisp base because it's not sat there in its own butter sort of cooking. We're also pricking. The pricking just helps um, any sort of moisture go this way rather than again being trapped between the base of the pan and the base of your tart giving you a soggy bottom so just a couple of little tricks and they're nothing sort of there's no magic <laughs> number one is to make sure you roll your pastry nice and thin if if it's rolled too thickly again you're going to the rest of the tart's going to cook but your base is still going to be cooking and it could be raw and you get that sogginess We've not added too much butter as we've greased our pan, so we're not adding extra liquid in there. We're not um, we're not uh, sort of just leaving it as it is. We've given the pricks to give some air to uh, escape as that warm air comes and it bakes, and we're also going to chill it for 30 minutes in the fridge. So that's our little tart case. In it goes for 30 minutes. In the meantime, then, these are the ones that I did last night. And they have just been out for room temperature for a little bit, but they are still, these are not as good pastry, so they're a bit brittle. So I'm giving it a bit of a helping hand. These are going to go in the oven now, which has been preheated to 180 degrees C, 350 Fahrenheit. And I'm going to take them straight back out again. Told you I'm organized, but not organized today. I want to bake them blind. <laughs> oh dear, somebody find my sanity. <laughs> so I want to bake blind. And baking blind, these have been these were pricked last night as well. But baking blind, you do. We're adding weight, basically, into our tart cases. And baking blind is essentially tricking the tart. There's some filling in it, so it's um, when it doesn't have any filling in it at all. So some baking parchment, if you 
just cut a square and then scrunch it up. It helps it sit in your tart. You say you can use baking beads if you can find them. I can't find them. There's some in the house somewhere. Or you can use dried pasta or dried rice, um, uncooked rice. I find if you have too much rice, um, you can end up with it escaping and you have to sort of get the rice out. The pasta, I find, is easier to get out of your tin. And you can just save it and just keep reusing it. So this is what I've got. Um, so I've put the squares of parchment in and adding my dried pasta into there. So this now will go in the oven. <laughs> We're going to bake them blind for 12 minutes and then remove the blind uh, bake and bake for another five. So where have we gone? 12. When you do it with the bigger um, tart, with the eight, with the, the one that we've got chilling, you bake for about 15 to 20 minutes blind and then remainder the last sort of um, five to eight minutes. So it works out about 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes in total. What I find is you want to look at your case, at your pastry case. When you see it, when you've blind baked it, you want to check that it's not sort of going crispy on the edges or anything like that. You might need just to chop and change your um, your bake time. So the bake time basically for the smaller ones is, let me say, 12 minutes, then five minutes. So it's about 17 to 20 minutes. You might need to up your last, um, your second unblind bake. Um, and then for your larger tart tin, then... Again, it's about 15 minutes, 15, 8, 17 minutes blind bake, and then five to eight minutes more unblind. And you just need to check that, uh, that case. So just going to have a quick tidy up. We've rescued some dough. I've shown you how we rescued the dough. We've made some cases. Um, Okay. I've got some pastry left. I could um, I could sort of make another tart if I wanted to. I could actually also roll out and make some little gingerbread men from it. Um, don't want to do that. I've got my gingerbread men for my decoration, but we're going to put this back in the fridge. So... Wrap it up. Now, this dough will keep in the freezer as well. So the dough that I made this morning, once it's nicely chilled, what I'll do is I'll go and wrap it up and I will put it in the freezer. I'll add an extra wrap of cling film, make sure it's well sealed, and it will keep for a good three months, if not longer. It will, the longer you keep it, the drier, and it can become more brittle. So I recommend three months in the freezer so the dough that I've made this morning, I will actually use for Christmas this week. Not this week, this year. See, it's just my words are not working properly today. And my pie is in there. So we're going to make a filling then. Let's just get rid of some... And the filling's really easy as well. How easy was rolling the pastry between those two pieces of um, kitchen paper, baking parchment? It's just my absolute favourite. I'm just going to, in the interest of reusing our, I'm not getting another clean bowl out. Wash up a bowl that we need. So 
So we're going to get on and make our filling. So this, whilst our tarts are a baked tart, for the case, uh, it's, it's a no-bake filling. So if you want to be even more efficient, you could do a no-bake tart case and a no-bake filling. But I like the tart case. That pastry, when you get that snap, is just right. So... I'm just thinking what we need to do. And I need my pan again. So we've made chocolate ganache quite a few times the last couple of weeks. It is that time of year. It's ganache time of year. It's indulgent time of year so um it's a lot you could do this actually you could do like um a gingerbread um like a bakewell and do a filling like that instead of having the cherry um jam but we're going to be doing a chocolate one so for our filling then we have our chocolate our cream, and our base, or whatever you put in, and our spices. So, what you'll want to do, like when making a ganache, is heat the cream and then pour it over everything else, or oh, in our extra butter. So, in here, this is my 300 mils of double cream i'm not going to heat this just yet i'm going to get everything else together because when i heat it it will heat really quickly and i don't want to scorch the cream so that's our cream in here then we're going to add our chocolate now like i said i'm using a mixture of dark and milk chocolate and that's so we get a nice uh, decadent filling, but it's not overpowering the, the gingerbreadiness that we want to include in there. So, I did this last one and showed you guys. I break my chocolate up in the packet. I find it a lot easier <laughs> to do. So, 100 grams, 150 grams of dark chocolate. And then our milk chocolate. And I say this is just not using any fancy one. The, the, we used the bone bill for that because I had that left over from the other week. But this is just standard Aldi milk chocolate. So... You can do this on a budget. Like if you say the flour, you don't have to use the expensive sugar. You can use just a regular dark sugar as well. Dark brown, soft dark brown sugar. And the last packet. We'll then put our cream on to heat. Find all the chocolate pieces. Ah. Oh. Sorry of all the packet noise. So, if you're not using alcohol, heat your cream and then pour it over your chocolate. But I want to use, oh, this has been in the cupboard waiting to be open for a long time. So this is a gingerbread sort of cream liqueur, like a gingerbread Baileys. This was from Aldi. They might do it again this year. They do different versions. Um, it's that good. I can't get the lid off 
Um, but you could use a, like a gingerbread syrup um, or another sort of like panda a piece. Um, probably saying that wrong. Um, liqueurs you can get as well. How much you include is entirely up to you. I'm going to be using 150 ml, which is about three shots. So the glug. And now this is open. It means I can drink. Not now I can't drink it. But, like, it's fair game for drinking it. Oh, it does smell gingerbready. Ooh. Oh, that's good. Mm. Oh, yes. We're going to be adding some extra to give it that kick. So if you're not using the alcohol, you don't have to worry about it. Um, you can add it just sort of just use the cream and the, the spices. But we've got now the alcohol and our cream in here. So I'm just going to heat this until it's bubbling. I'm not going to cook it. So it's just a low, gentle heat. See how our pastry cases probably need a little bit. Just going to up that to four minutes. So chocolate, whilst that melts, we're going to add some spices in. We're going to use the same spice mix that we used for the tart case, but not in those same quantities. I'm also not going to use the cloves because they'll come through a bit too much here. So, and you can just do this at this point. Don't have to wait. See, new spice jar. And our butter. Totally forgot that. Nearly telling everybody about bake fails this week, this week. And I'm just having one after another. So in here, I'm going to add a teaspoon of ground ginger this time. So that's, remember, this is half a teaspoon. I'm going to add half a teaspoon of cinnamon. quarter of a teaspoon of all mixed spice get that the wrong way around all spice and mixed spice are not the same thing and quarter or pinch of nutmeg there we go and then our remaining butter, which I nearly forgot, 55 grams of that add in with your chocolate and your spices. And that's coming up to the boil. Not boil, but heating. So it just starts bubbling around the edges. We're going to pour that over this, give it a let it sit first. The chocolate starts to melt and then we'll start stirring it up together. So, in the meantime, our cases are baking, they're nearly ready. Just gonna give that a wipe down. Some rubbish. It is really, it is, despite the fact I say it's to me, it isn't really because you need to do the rolling and all the, it's not really technical, but it's doing all those fiddly little bits. So it's less beginner, more intermediate. But actually, the process of making the pastry and the process of making the filling are really simple. They're not, uh, um, they're not sort of, they're not technical. It's things like for making, getting the pastry in the tart case. That's nearly done. They're about to ping. So 
I'm going to turn that down so we can take the blind out of the pastry cases. We'll do that first. Oh, smells lush. And all I do is just put these into a fresh bowl to um, to cool down because then, like I say, I can reuse them. But it says fiddly. So this is why you don't want to be doing it with rice. Now I can't lift this up, but that blind bake has meant that the bottom of my tart hasn't bubbled up and uh, sort of become really uneven. It's sort of an even texture all across there. Um, they smell amazing. Just gonna. So there they are. They're going back in for about another five to seven minutes. We'll put them on for six. Let's go halfway. This won't go like a real dark um, gingerbread colour. It'll be that sort of light gingerbread colour there. So, right. And in the meantime, that has started to bubble around the outside. and it's ready to go. You want to catch this when you're doing the cream before it forms a skin on the top. And make sure whenever you're doing this, when the bowl that you're pouring into is heat proof. Um, you don't want that to, if you pour it in and it's not heat proof and it shocks it, it will split the bowl and it will be a very nasty mess. So that's our cream and our alcohol there. You could, if you don't have gingerbread style Baileys, you could just use regular Baileys and add a little bit of extra of your spices in because we're going to taste this when it starts to cool down and see if we want to add any more in there. So... Just leave this. It's very tempting to stir. This trivet says hot, and if you get it in the wrong place, the bowl sits in the O and falls out. Um, so that's why it's just fiddling. It's tempting to get in there and stir this, but if you do that, then you can cause the chocolate to sort of become grainy. You're sort of aggravating it a little bit too soon. Give it a moment just to sit with the butter melting, with the spices, with the chocolate there before we all with do something about that. But I don't think they will. As I was saying, you can start to see when your chocolate is melting if you're using a glass bowl. This is a Pyrex bowl. And then gently... I probably should have used a slightly smaller bowl, bigger bowl. Uh, I was using it gently. Bring everything together. You'll see the chocolate there is quite chunky still it's melting but it's not melted melted yet this does smell amazing if you want to add some more chocolate in you can add it now so if you wanted to add I would only add sort of like 50 grams more at this point. 
Depends how chocolatey you want it. Now we're just going to pour this into the tart tin, into the tart cases. But you could, if you wanted to, and there's one on the site from a very long time ago, you could put a layer of caramel underneath it um, and then let that set slightly in the fridge before pouring over the chocolate filling. It's coming together now. Stirring it as well means you're getting all your spices mixed through. You could, I was trying to think what else you could use, um, like between the chocolate and the case. I was thinking you could put a layer of Biscoff because that's got the cinnamony and that warmy, spicy um, flavour that would sort of really go really well together. I think I might add a little bit of extra chocolate to this. Not too much. So I'm just going to use one of those squares of parchment. They're nearly done. I'm just going to add a handful of chocolate chips. And it's entirely up to you. The, the, the chocolate um, quantities work well. So... want a little bit of a darker so I'm just adding some dark chocolate chips a little meltdown I'm trying to think what else you could put in it's a very reflective day today I think I'm trying to think else what you could put I just think if you're doing anything like this something like caramel with the cho chocolate and caramel together in that sort of combination goes so well well um when those come out i'll put the main tart in and we'll have a look and then then i'll start to wrap up so you guys can enjoy your sunday so this is our filling it's nice oops there we go and ready to go. I can pick that up now, that's fine. And I have So just whilst they give a little bit of a cool, we're going to get that tart tin out the fridge, the one that we've set this morning. So this is going in on a baking sheet at 180 for, I'm going to put it on for 17 minutes blind bake and then um, take that off and for another 10, 5 to 10 minutes, 7 to 10 minutes. To complete. So I'm going to use my big pastry um, thing that I've got to sit that there. Oops. Hidden by a chocolate and a burma. I just clutched this morning. So that's in there, and I'm going to use the pasta from earlier as well. I say there's a baking sheet in there so that's just going to go on there now I'm going for 17 minutes to start with so it'd be about 25 in total. These then have finished. 
and our chocolate filling is set. Now, I don't really want to pour this straight in there because it will cook. Um, now, I want to make sure this starts to cool a little bit first. Look at that. It smells immense. I'm just going to see if we can just bring everything together, see if I can salvage being a klutz today. So these are our pastry cases with the rings around them. They are moving nicely, so I should, remember it's hot, and to carefully lift off. Now, you'll see people then go round with a, like a microplane filing down the edges. I haven't got time for that. But, there we have our pastry case. And when you do these, you don't need to seal it. So you, you cut the base out first and then you do the sides and trim it off like we did with the main pan. Uh, tart, but as it bakes, the two will join together. So, just going to sit them on there. And then, what you can do as well is if that's it, you do, you're not ready to fill them, you can, if you want to just use all the dough, you can pre make your pastry cases and put them in the freezer. And they'll last sort of about three to six months there in the freezer. So that's another way of doing it. So if you've got enough pastry for two and you just want to make it, pop it in the freezer, cut it, uh, bake it, chill it, put it in the freezer. Hot. So then with these, you want to... Pour your chocolate in. I'm going to see what I can do. And then... Your chocolate filling. This is cooled down now. I can really hold it. It's not a problem. I've got a big jug. So I have a lot of filling. I have a big jug for all of this because what I don't want to do is try and pour it from the bowl and it will go everywhere. So I'm just going to try a little bit. Ah! Oh. That is good. You've got the chocolate, you've got the gingerbread from the liqueur if you're using it or a syrup, and then We've got those spices through. So I'm going to put it into my jug. That's only because it's easier. You could, if you've got a heat proof jug, you could do this straight in that rather than having to transfer um, But my Pyrex jug is tiny. So I'm only going to do one. Oh, wow, no, it's still all of them. And hope it doesn't, hope all my cracks are. I think so. Or until it's just reaching the top. It will self level. There we go. And then the rest will go in the big tart. These need to now go in the fridge and set for a good hour, if not more. So that has now cooled down. Should have just left them on there, but I wanted to cool them down a little bit quicker. So I'm going to... one. Two, three. 
These will go in the fridge now. Being so careful when I move them that I don't spill. There we go. That's it. They're done. Chocolate's done. I'm all a bit over the shop, but I think, despite the fact I'm a bit discombobulated, I think we've survived this morning. <laughs> I think we've got through a gingerbread tart. Actually, almost, it'll actually start to end because they're in the fridge chilling, which is unusual because you don't normally see the finished thing. I'm going to let you guys have your Sunday back. I'm going to figure out what on earth is going wrong with my head. Uh, but we have today made um, a mess, and we have also made a gingerbread tart. So the gingerbread tart, the dough itself will make probably then about two of these tarts, which will serve, if you're making the eight-inch version, about eight to ten people. You don't want massive slices. That thing is quite rich. And so we've made that gingerbread pastry, um, which has been blind baked in the oven at the moment. And I call this an intermediate, a skill level, because it just needs a little bit of patience when you're putting the pastry in the tart. Everything else, as you see in the pros, it's really easy pastry to make, and it's a no-bake filling, which, is, again, you've seen is really, really easy. But it, it does need a little bit of patience just when you're sorting that pastry into your tart tin. It's warm. It's spicy, and with that chocolate, spicy, gingerbready ganache, it's really, really indulgent. So it makes a great Christmas festive um, dessert. Cons, you do need to mine out for your soggy bottom. We talked about the different things that you can do for that. Chill your pastry before you bake it. Prick the bottom, blind bake. Uh, make sure it's nice and thin and not thick. And that will, you know, there is no magic solution to the uh, no soggy bottom things. Thank you very much, Rachel. Oh, sorry, I'm a bit discombobulated today, <laughs> but they do look heavenly. I can't, yeah, there's lots here. Some of them will be going in the freezer. <laughs> uh, ingredients wise, it does look a lot, a long ingredients list, but remember, most of them will be your spices. We've got some unsalted butter in there for the pastry and for the filling. And because we melt the butter for this, we don't need to have the, the, the butter at room uh, fridge temperature. So it can be at room temperature, however that goes. We've got some dark, soft brown sugar. I've used the Billington's molasses sugar, but you can use regular dark brown sugar. You can use light brown sugar. The dark brown sugars just give a bit more intensity to your gingerbread dough and give it that really deep, dark flavor and look and texture. Golden syrup or runny honey for our sweetness help bind our gingerbread dough together. And then we've used plain flour. No raising agents in this. It's a pastry. So plain or all-purpose flour. Our spice mix. Then we've had um, ground ginger. We've got some mixed spice in there. We've got some cinnamon, some ground cloves, just a little bit, and some ground nutmeg. And these all come together for our lovely, lovely flavor, gingerbread flavor. And we've used those spices as well through our filling, which uh, is using dark chocolate, milk chocolate. So we get a really rich but not too heavy filling there with some double cream and some gingerbread liqueur. If you don't have gingerbread liqueur, you can use Baileys and just tweak your spices through it. Equipment-wise... We've got one in, in an eight inch loose base tart tin, but you can also use the perforated individual tart rings if you want to. You need some baking sheets and some baking parchment. Now, I made my pastry by hand with just a big bowl, but you can, if you want to, use a hand mixer or a stand mixer to bring everything together. You will need a rolling pin for rolling your pastry out. And the usual accoutrements, rubber spatulas, palette knives if you want to make sure your top is all level, but it should self-level, and plenty of spoons as always. 
you'll find the recipe up on the site as soon as possible, sort of I, hopefully tomorrow by the time I've baked take, and they, they've set and I've taken some pictures. But I will let you know when it goes up. But you can always find the full recipe and more down here at crumbscorkscrews.com. And as usual, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Thank you for joining me on Sunday. Thank you for observing the two-minute silence at 11 a.m. this morning for Remembrance Sunday. Thank you for just bearing with me whilst I've been a bit discombobulated, but it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but next week, we really get into festive mode. I mean, I've got my gingerbread men earrings in today. But next week... Is stir up Sunday and it feels really early, but remember Christmas is on a Sunday this week, this week, this year. So Advent starts a little earlier. Stir up Sunday is when we traditionally create a Christmas pudding and get that in, or your people do their Christmas cakes and get that all ready and feed it over the next couple of weeks before Christmas. But it does mean that it the following weekend is the start of official Advent and four weeks to Christmas. Oh, my life. It's going to be good. We're going to start with the festiveness. Like, properly. Um, but we will be doing something Stir Up Sunday. I'm trying to think of alternatives that I've done for Christmas puddings and things to try. I might actually put it out to the vote and see what you guys think. But enough of that. It is another, as you can tell, beautiful sunny day here in the Cotswolds. Yesterday was lush. It was like 17, 18 degrees outside. It's crazy. Um, go enjoy yourselves. Have a fabulous time. And I will see you next weekend. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe and well. And thanks for watching. Bye.